Hey everybody, my name is Kyle. I serve as the lead pastor here at Trinity. I'm so thankful to be a part of a group of people who are creating an experience where people can come and belong even before they believe. And so if you're new with us today, we hope you've already experienced that. Well, my family, we're on a sabbatical right now, which is just a time for us to be refreshed and renewed and spend some intentional time with one another. And I'm so thankful for my staff and the group of people who have been speaking while I'm gone. You are in for a treat today as you get to hear from a good friend of mine, Beverly Jenkins. Her and her husband lead Refuge in Restoration, a church that we partner with and do several things uh, with throughout the year. Uh, they have a great marriage ministry. They do marriage retreats and actually have a radio show uh, helping people in their marriages. And so I'm extremely excited for you to hear from her today. If you would, welcome Beverly. Praise the Lord. Praise God. That was neat. I love the video introduction. That's cool. I'm going to drag this over. Listen, we are excited to be here with you. Our church is Refuge and Restoration, and they, some of them are here with us today. And uh, we want to say thank you um, to your church, to your pastor. Um, I think we've been in fellowship with this church for about maybe been a yeah, it's been a long time. And so we just we just thank you. I mean, y'all let us baptize. We use all y'all stuff. We just you know. <laughs> You just kind of let us come in and take over, and, um, and we're very appreciative of that. Um, that's community. That's community. It's not community if we don't get to use your stuff. Right? <laughs> so bless God. Listen, um, I, don't, I don't really know what to share with you. Um, your pastor really kind of said it all um, in, a, in a nutshell, um, that we are in perilous times, but the Lord has not left us ignorant of the enemy's devices. He is a good God. <laughs> no matter what we face, no matter what trial we go through, no matter the things that we see in this world, we know that we have an advocate with the Father. Y'all don't believe me. <laughs> but we have an advocate with the Father. I just was thinking about what Paul said. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall save me from this body of death? But it's my Lord, Jesus Christ, who'll save me. It's not a quick answer, like he said. It's not a quick solution. But the solution that we have has already been born on the cross. And so if we lead people, maybe the message that I'm going to give to you today is the message for maybe someone who's on the outside. So maybe the message that's coming today is not necessarily for you, but it's for somebody you need to take it to. Somebody who's in our circles, who's not necessarily connected with the cross, not necessarily connected with what it is that we believe as believers. There may be someone in this room today who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And that means that you might be a little bit um, maybe confused about what's happening in the world today, or maybe even afraid. Well, let's not forget the word angry. <laughs> Come on, we the church, right? We can be honest, we can be transparent about what's going on, we can say what we really feel, mean what we mean, and then believe it, right? And so our faith is working for us no matter what. So whatever it is that we've put our faith in, it works for us. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, he begins to work on our behalf. We put our faith in ourself, we're a lost generation. And then we lose the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And we think that what we've seen the worst, we haven't seen the worst. So this message that we're given, listen, it's not by chance. This is, these scriptures that your pastor gave to me, he gave to me three months ago. Yeah, so when I read them to you, you're going to be like, oh, my God. And I'm sure you already know where we're going. We already know where we're going. But we bless God for Trinity Church. So before I go right into the scriptures, um, I just want to pray, really. So, Father, we thank you. We magnify you, Jesus. You are the author and the finisher of our faith, God. And so, Father, we bless you, God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we agree in you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are sovereign. You knew this day was coming before the foundation of this world, God. You're not surprised. You're not thrown off. You're not upset. You're not trying to figure it out. You already knew this was coming. So, God, we thank you that you were wise enough, wise enough to know how to handle it. So, God, we follow your lead. We follow your direction, God. As I give your word, God, I pray right now that you would allow me to decrease 
that you would increase, God, that there would be none of Beverly left, God, but that you would speak, God, and that we would hear you, that the words, God, that pass through my lips, God, that they would hit hearts that are prepared to receive, God. And then those same words, God, I pray right now, God, that you would allow those same words, God, to also baptize me. And so, Father, we bless you for that today, God. Father, I breathe you in. I take you in, God, and I thank you right now that even as I'm speaking, I want to expel me. And, Father, we just bless you for today, God. I thank you for Trinity, and we love you, God. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's go ahead and read the word. I'm going to read all of the word, the scriptures that um, your pastor sent to me three months ago, okay? So we're in James chapter 4, starting at verse 1. And the scripture reads, it says, and I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. I know you all have the NIV. Some of you have the NIV, your pastor was saying, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of old school. I'm stuck. <laughs> I'm just stuck. So James chapter 4, verse 1, it says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? What are we fighting over? Is it fear driving us to fight? Is it my own ideas driving me to fight? What are we fighting over? From whence come these wars? It says you lust and you have not. You kill and you desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not. Still don't got nothing to fight. Because you ask not. The only one who can answer the problem, we ain't asked him. Okay, amen. Verse three, it says, you ask and you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Now I told y'all, he gave me these scriptures three months ago. Don't nobody be throwing none up here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. We got to pick. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So here's our instructions. Verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and you purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, what your pastor just say, and mourn, <laughs> and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Verse 10 says, humble yourselves. I think it's a lot of humility in these scriptures right here. Humble yourselves in the sight of God, and he shall lift you up. Verse 11 and 12, these are the last two. It says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Last verse, it says, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that thou judgest one another? Those are the verses that he sent to me three months ago. I don't even have to preach, do I, y'all? That's enough. It's enough. So in those scriptures, I just want to share with you there's five key instructions that James left us to have a perfect community. And when I say perfect, I mean a mature community, a community that can withstand anything, a community that can go through something and still be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water and stand. Y'all don't believe me, I'm telling you. The instructions are in the word. And so it says, this is what God gave to me. He started asking me these questions about community because this is something that you all are always used to is talking about community and the bridging the gap and actually reconciliation and, and doing things that actually pull people together as opposed to breaking them apart. And so that's a blessing. That's a complete blessing. And so this is something that you all are already used to. This is something that we are, some of us are learning. Some of us are yet still trying to figure out. So anyway, in my study of looking at community, I started realizing that sometimes we call something a community that's not a community, okay? Just because we have cars next door to each other, or we have houses planted next to each other, or we have garages that back up against each other does not make it a community. Although it looks like community, it's got the trees, it's got the plants, it's got all the makings of a community, but yet there's something missing 
that really actually causes it to be a community, okay? And I asked God, I said, God, what is it that you call community, right? What do you really, what do you really say community is? And so he started to show me in the book of Acts that that was his idea of community, that they have all things in common. The beginning word of community is common. Not meaning that we're not, I'm not talking about a movement where you say your stuff and then you bring me all your, you know, I'm not talking about that kind of movement. I'm talking about a movement that has an understanding that the commonality is, is that we speak the same language, the language of Christ. He gives us a new language, a new understanding. Not my own language, not my idea about the language, not what it is that I want to do, not my opinion about the language, but a language that we all can take part in, one that is unified. That's his language. It's the only language that actually can unite community. If we're speaking the same thing, you speak Bible, I speak Bible, then baby, we in community. Yeah, Y'all can clap today. So our doctrine would be in common. So we speak the same language. Our prayers would be in common. And that we would be able to eat together and play together. That's what was in Acts 2 and 42. They ate together, they played together, they stayed together, they hung up. That was community. If I don't know anything about you, I don't know your kids, I don't know your hurts, I don't know your kids' kids' hurts, I don't know the things you went through in your house, I don't know that your husband left you, I don't know that your kids, maybe perhaps somebody in your family is an alcoholic, I don't know that I should pray for you, I don't know you. It's not community. We just live in the same neighborhood. But community is, is that when I come over to your house, you bake goods for me. <laughs> You come over to my house and we bake goods together. You understand? My girlfriends and I, we get together. We used to get together every year and we used to make these cookies, cookie tins together because we were like, we don't, you know, you figure out ways to be creative when you don't want to spend $4,000 on Christmas. So we get together and we would make, ooh, that was rough. We make some cookie tins together and we would give those out. That was our kind of community. My, those, those girls, those women that I, we were working together and we were just playing in the kitchen and when I got tired of staring, somebody else picked the spoon up. You understand? It builds community. It builds, and that's just a small thing. But we gotta do that to have real community. You gotta let me in your house. Bring me over. I'm gonna bring you over. Now, I don't, I, don't, I don't cook traditional food. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like, listen. See, we gotta have the conversation too. <laughs> Because we, we all scared of each other, for real. We really are. We're afraid. I don't, I don't cook traditional. I don't know nothing about no collard greens. Now, y'all going to get mad at me. I don't. I try my best to cook a really good pot of collard greens. I'm from the South, from the country, and don't know. I can't, I, I'm going to get it right one day. <laughs> I'm waiting on that moment where that actually, you know. But those are the things that we have to know about one another. If you know that about me, then you're going to bring me some spinach. You know that about me. So community becomes a place of safety, a place where you know one another. The Bible says, know them that labor among you. Know them. No, to know somebody is not just on the outside appearances. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. You know that there are places in my life that I have traveled, and the way that I got to Jesus was not by something pretty. You find that out about me. You find out that, that there were things that happened in my life when I was a child. You find out that there are things that happened in, 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 in my family's life that, that brought me to a place where I got to know Jesus. You find, when you know that about somebody, that breaks community. It makes us walk on equal, because guess what? No one can be here and here when you find out that you both were sinners who needed a savior. Everybody becomes all, it's even playing field when you realize that you need a savior. And that's for the whole world. That's not just for us inside of this church. We gotta take that message out there that you are like me. Whether you like it or not, you like me. <laughs> we all the same. We are all the same, fighting for the same thing, the same needs. I don't wanna be afraid either. I don't wanna be angry either. I don't wanna, I don't, you know, I pull up Facebook some days and I have to, I'm a pastor and sometimes I take everything in me not to cuss. Oh, y'all, okay. I'm just telling you the truth. The truth is, is that sometimes, listen, I tell this, this is a joke in our house and I play with my husband. I grew up in a, a Southern community, very Southern, meaning like um, that most of the black people that were in the community was just me and my family. 
it wasn't bad. See, that's that's the thing. You know what I mean? Is that that when when I say that, people go, ooh, no. My experiences were completely different. I didn't even find out I was black until Ferguson happened. <laughs> Social media told me. I looked on Facebook and I went, that's how you felt, Rhonda? I didn't know. <laughs> Y'all can laugh, I'm telling you. It's some things that we harbor in our hearts that don't always come out until tragedy strikes. And then you get to see, this is, there, there is a purpose in this. All things work together for the good of them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. All things. So all of this stuff is a squeeze to let us know exactly where we stand in Christ. Are we standing on a solid rock or are we standing on sinking sand? Who is it that you're going to be? There's only a couple people that's going to make it into heaven. I don't mean like a couple as in two or three. I mean the couple is, for instance, I was looking at this video and for a moment, I told people all the time that it, for a moment, I almost despaired over this video. This boy had put this video on, online and it was just, he was talking about the judgment of God. And I thought to myself, my God, because he kept saying he got to this line. He said all these people had these seeds in their chest and they were walking up to God and they were looking at God and God was talking to them. And he said and they felt so bad about all the things they had done in their life. And I kept thinking, who can make it? Who gonna get in, God? I said, if if this is, I said, if the line, I said, first of all, the line is long anyway. <laughs> Who's gonna make it? And then at the end of the video, I started to get an understanding because God had to catch me from being dis a, in despair in my own mind. And I said, who can make it? And He said, listen, it's only two people that get put out that don't accept. Like for instance, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's a guaranteed end, right? Now here's the two things that can keep you out. Even after you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, not forgiving others and becoming a stumbling block. And I thought, my God, that makes all the sense in the world. So my responsibility is that I am to forgive those who trespass against me. And if I can't do that, if I let anger overtake me and take me to a place that pulls me from the cross, then we don't make it. If I become a stumbling block, get so angry that we start acting out of our flesh and become a stumbling block to others, don't make it. I don't make it. I don't make it. So this message that we're speaking about today has to be something that we actually grasp, hold on to, understand, and then give out to others. That when someone's in our circles and they're talking kind of crazy and they're saying things that, that are against what it is that God would say, some of us want to be silent, but this is not the time to be silent. This is the time to say what's wrong and what's right in Christ. Not in your opinion, not in your ideas, but what does the word of God say about this situation? And speak the word. Okay, so there's five things. The first thing is in verse 8 that builds a perfect community. Submit to God and resist the enemy. Now that seems simple, doesn't it? It's the first rule of community is that there's no community without God. We have no community without God because we have no fellowship. The Bible says that if we have fellowship with the Father, then we can have fellowship with one another. So it's not by power, it's nor by might, but it's by his spirit. So we have to resist the enemy, right? So that means that we have to set ourselves against anything that opposes God. Resisting means that I have to take an actual stand against something. I can't just stand back and go, oh, I'm going to take a position of neutrality. Oh, there is no neutrality. Anything that's lukewarm gets spewed out. There is no neutrality. There's no neutral ground. I'm either with God or I'm not. I'm either for you or I'm against you. And so God said there's no neutrality in community. So we submit to God and then we take a physical and a spiritual stand, not a physical stand as in fighting. I'm talking about a physical stand as in you take a position. You say, this is where I stand on this, and this is where I'm, I'm, this is where I'm laying my hat on this, with God. Set yourself against things that oppose God. Two, he said, cleanse your hands, you sinners. That's still in verse 8, too. It says, cleanse your hands. It's not the kind of fasting that I've chosen for you. I want to read this from Isaiah. You don't have to go there. But it says, is not this the kind of fasting that I've chosen? 
to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer shelter? When you see the naked, clothe them and don't turn away your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear and the righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call on the Lord and he will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do what? Do away with the yoke of oppression and with the pointing of finger. And then the last thing he says, malicious talk. God, God. So with our hands, we offer the right hand of fellowship. The right hand of fellowship is in Galatians 2 and 9. It says it was extended to actually prove community. The right hand of fellowship, the word means kononia. It means communion, joint participation, intimacy. We got a bond. I'm giving you the right hand of fellowship. I'm giving you the ability to speak into my life. I'm giving you the ability to say, you wrong, you right. I'm giving you community. When I give you the right hand of fellowship, I'm cleansing my hands. He said, cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. He said, who shall enter in but those with a clean heart and pure hands? Pure heart and clean hands. Pure heart and clean hands. Those are the ones who enter in. The right hand of fellowship is extended. So proof that we're in community together is that I'm joyous at seeing you coming. Peter did something that was really interesting in, in um, Galatians. When he was with the folks that he knew, yeah, yeah, you know this story. In that same chapter where he's talking about the right hand of fellowship, Paul was rebuking Peter. And he said, when I, when I, when I was with you, you was hanging out with the Gentiles. You was cool. We was all together. We was eating together. We was supping together. But when your folks came, you moved your seat. <laughs> oh, God. It's the church here. When your people came, when your nation showed up, when the people that look like you, when the people that know you showed up, you moved your seat. But when we was together hanging out telling people all about the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength, and we was telling people how good God was, we was together, we were in this thing, so it's possible. That's what God is saying. The possibilities are great. This is not a chastisement. This is that, God, look at y'all. Y'all this, this is y'all are an amazing church. Listen, I just want to tell you, Trinity Church has been an amazing church. This is not a rebuke to the church. This is a rebuke to all the world who looks at the church and mocks us. It says that our God don't work. Our God works harder than anybody else around here. We sometimes miss God because we don't always follow his promptings. But our God works, and he's working on our behalf. So community is us building the essence together and saying that I want to know you. Not only do I want to know you, but I'm going to be intentional about getting to know you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to say to you, hey, where you at? I ain't seen you in a couple of weeks. Where you been, Sally? That's real community. That's real community. We don't just check on who we think we want to sit next to, but we check on all of the people. We check on one another. We check on one another. So Peter was rebuked for that. Listen, I was in Disney World, and we love Disney World. And Disney World is like, a, it's, it can be quite, uh, y'all. some of y'all been to Disney World. It's like another world, for real. It's like, it take you out of reality, right? Well, this past few years that we've been going, because of all the chaos that's going on in the world, Disney World even became like my world. And I was like, you know what? I come to Disney World to escape my world. I don't want to go to Disney World and feel like I'm at home. Yeah. So anyway, what happened was this man came, like usually me and my husband, we kind of crazy because we try our best to like be intentional about just making friends while we're on the trip, right? So anyway, we just like sit next to people. Sometimes people just like literally do get up, y'all, for real. That do happen. Okay, but listen, this, this man came. He almost sat in my lap. I mean, literally. And I was like, <laughs> should I move? So as soon as he opened his mouth, I heard this Australian accent, right? And I've never been to Australia, never lived in Australia. But I saw his comfortableness with sitting with people who didn't necessarily look like him. And in my heart, I said, I wish it was like that in America. Yes, I wish that. I went to bread company. And at bread company one day, there was no tables to be found inside a bread company. 
And I was like, oh my God, I, you know, what? because I, I love bread company. I want to sit in here and eat. And this lady, cute little old white lady, just beckoned to me. She said, come over here and sit with me. And I was like, oh, okay. So I got my stuff and I went over to her table and as soon as she started to talk, I heard she had a European accent, right? I'm going somewhere. And so that European accent, and she said, she said, oh, in Europe, she said, we don't have tables to ourselves. She said, y'all do that like that here. She said, we sit with one another. And I said, I wish, I said, I wish we did that in America. I got story after story of moments in my mind where I said, I wish we do that in America. And God said, why don't you do it? <laughs> it starts with us. It starts with me being at bread company and saying, hey, come sit at my table. You know what I mean? Just being goofy enough and crazy enough to say that, just to do that. And so, and not being, and not being afraid, because really what we're most afraid of is rejection. It is really not, the most of us are not walking around prejudice and racist. We are really walking around saying to ourselves, I, I don't know if they're gonna reject me. I don't know if they're gonna receive me. When I say come sit at my table, I don't know if they're gonna say, boo, you know. <laughs> I don't know. And so we're afraid, we're walking around. And I'm saying today to say to you, I encourage you, everyone in here today, that when you leave here, be intentional about what it is that you do. Be intentional about grabbing somebody and hugging them. When we sat on the bus just this year, it was a wonderful encounter. We sat on the bus with this couple and we just talked and talked and talked the whole bus ride. It was about a 40 minute bus ride, white couple, and we just had the most amazing conversation. Do you know at the end of that conversation that man says to us, thank you all so much. And we were like, for what? For what? Now, we never got the answer to that question, but he kept saying that. But it dawned on us, with all the chaos that's going on in this world, nobody's talking to one another. We kind of are walking around like this, like, like, I hope they don't see me, I hope they don't look at me, and I hope, you know, and then if we go into a place, we are looking for people who are like us because we're thinking, oh God, you know, there's this, all this unrest is in our world. But I want you to know that that unrest is in this world also has another purpose that's working against us. It's distracting us from the true purpose. And that is winning souls to Jesus Christ. He that winning souls is wise. So we better start walking like this and start saying that for the people who don't want to look at us, and just you just go, just give them the biggest bear hug you can. <laughs> just, just listen. I, I, I don't even know if I can say this in here, but I'm going to say it anyway. This, this, this young man used to open a church for us in um, the theater. He was just a mean guy, right? It had nothing to do with, it had nothing to do with nothing, but in fact, he was just mean. And so we just, we just decided our church was like, we're just going to hug the hell out of him. <laughs> and so we were able to by the end of that thing he was hugging us he was finding us and hey can I get a hug you know can you know and so I'm saying that to say that most people are afraid of rejection they're not afraid of you they're really afraid of being rejected and so we got to just keep pressing pressing keep pressing play in your mind be conscious of where you are and go for it just go for it but we realize that we are aliens in this world that we are pilgrims walking through this this planet you hear me we don't belong here we are in this world but we're not of it and so it's foreign to us it's strange to us and so we find these strange things that are going on around us and we get a little perturbed over them and we're like come on can't we all just love one another can't we just do that but you can't apart from Christ it is an impossibility so the third thing purify our hearts you double-minded so purifying our heart means that we have to make clean our souls, meaning that we make clean what we think, how we feel, and what it is we desire. The double-mindedness double means that we can lose double-mindedness when we change our mind. Sometimes you can change your mind just in a matter of a conversation. When you find out someone's experiences, you find out where they came from, you find out why they feel the way they feel. It can change your mind. But if we hold on to our own mind, see the Bible says be not conformed by this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, we're conforming to a lot of things and being transformed by nothing. Conform means that I mold to it. I decide that it's good. This world is good, but that's what the scripture says. That's enmity or against God. When I mold to the world and I take their stances and I say that's right, that's yes, that's yea and amen, and God is saying you ain't gonna align me with Yo, yay, and amen over something that I haven't aligned myself with. He's not having that. And so we have to purify our minds. We have to change our minds. And that's something that's, that's a decision. 
We think that something magical is going to come down out of the sky and actually go, change your mind. No, I, I, wish, it, I wish it was that easy because then I would have accepted Christ at, at new birth, right? <laughs> be like, yay, Jesus. But no, that's not what happens. We have to be transformed by the re renewing of our mind. So four, it says be afflicted and mourn. James has got some good stuff in here that actually gives us a great illustration of what it is that we're to do for one another. So it says be afflicted and mourn. And all that is is have some empathy. We stand in anyone. I don't care if it's uh, uh, Chinese people, Indian people. It's God dealt with nations. But we've been afraid to call ourselves what we are. I'm a black woman. Yeah, you know? But we, 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 happen, we happen to be so afraid sometimes of expressing who we are, especially if we're in the midst of people who are of a different nation. And the fear of that has created this idea that now either I have to hide. It's either this fight or flight thing that takes place. And God is saying that I call all nations unto me. All nations. So having empathy means that I look at your situation as your situation. And I can stand in the seat of it. I can stand, put my feet in there and go, I really understand that. I get that. Empathy is different than sympathy. Most people don't want sympathy. They don't want you to look at their situation and go, oh, that's a terrible thing that happened. Because that don't do nothing. But empathy, when you stand in someone else's shoes and you get a glimpse of how it is that they feel, think, and their desires, when you get a glimpse of their soul, then you get a chance to see how they hurt. And you can identify with that hurt and that pain in your own life. You can go, God, I remember when I was rejected. I remember when I was hurt. I remember when they forgot about me. No matter what the situation is, you can be walking around high school, you watch kids, and the reason why we have kids who fight each other or do things inside of high school is because there's no empathy. You don't know what it's like to feel like the nerd. <laughs> I certainly didn't know what it felt like to be the nerd. I didn't know. I wasn't the nerd. I was the kid who just was like, I, I was on autopilot in high school. I should have probably, yeah, anyway, that's a whole nother. Be afflicted and mourn, have empathy. It says, weep with those that weep. Live in harmony with one another. Matthew 5 and 4 says, blessed are those that mourn, for they will be comforted. Community empathizes with its neighbor's pain. I remember my grandmother used to say this all the time. We lived in the country. Like I told you, we lived on a dirt road. And in the country, the fire department is like really far away usually. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> she would say to me all the time that, you know, if you see your neighbor's house on fire, it's best not to watch. Go get a bucket. <laughs> and it wasn't because your house could catch on fire, because you really could act like you didn't care, because your houses were so far apart in the country. You, nobody, you know what I mean? But she says, it's best to go grab a bucket, because nobody knows when, when tragedy going to strike your house. And you're going to need a neighbor to go and grab a bucket. <laughs> oh, come on, bless God. Bless God. You're going to need somebody. And so that's what community creates. But if we don't know one another, then we probably don't see one another. When I know you, I see you. I see that you don't look like you're yourself today. I see that there may be something going on in your house or something going on in your family or something going on in your job, something I need to ask about because I know you. Knowing someone gives me permission to see them, gives me permission to see them. So the last thing that I'm gonna make for you uh, a point is, is the last one. It says, don't speak evil. This is in verse 11. Verse 11 says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother judges the law. And I had the hardest time with the scripture because I thought, you know, because everybody's spoken evil against somebody, right? Okay, y'all act like y'all, okay, I'm the only one. Okay, no, everybody says something bad about somebody. And I said, how is it that if you say something bad about somebody that judges the law, God? You know what I mean? Like, how does that work like that? And he said, do you not understand that the law, that word means, it's, it says nomos. It means that it's a, it's, it's the actual word for really him. God is the law. So if you speak ill against your brother, he says that you are speaking ill against me, the creator of your brother. And therefore you judge the law. So anything that you judge, he said, you can't perform. So our mouth actually, and we've been talking about this in our church, our mouth actually leads a pathway or carves out or niches out a pathway for who it is that we're going to be 
and what world we're going to walk on. So when we speak evil against our brother, we are actually carving out a pathway against our brother. So we put ourselves in opposition against our brother. And I'm going to tell you, nobody's ever had community with anybody they spoke evil against. It's impossible. It's impossible to have bitter water and sweet water come out of the same sister. It's impossible for us to speak ill against our brother and then at the same time say, now come over and have dinner. We're not going to do that. So this is why that advice that God gives us or this command or this idea or this, this precept, don't speak evil against your brother because not only do you speak evil against your brother, but you judge me. That word judge means crino. It says you are, it's the implication of being tried, condemned, and then punished in the eyesight or in the minds of other people. I was like, oh my God, we are, we, and I know we know what judgment is, but I don't think we know how it comes forth. But judgment comes forth through the speaking of evil against our brother. So speech builds a pathway to actions and then also attitudes, attitudes. So the community effect, yeah, yeah, bless God. So this is a question that God put to me. He said, will you be a nation that yields the sword of Christ through love? Will we be that nation? Will we be the nation that yields the message of Christ through love? Or will we be the nation that has decided that our ideas or our soul, wherever our soul may be, as far as how we think, feel, and want, if those things will take precedence, if my fleshly desires, my ideas about life will take precedence over the love of Christ. Every citizen must be seen and have a voice. And this is the part that we have to also make sure. This is intentional that every citizen has to have an equitable seat at the table. That's the idea of true reconciliation, is that we are seen as equals, we are seen as partners in this, we are seen as people of God all together. Not one against the other, but an equitable partnership that speaks love, that speaks values. The Bible says that they will know you by the love that you show one to another. And so it's such a blessing to be in that house today. Amen. Y'all give the Lord a hand, praise. Just want to end with this. I, I fell in love with this particular song um, because it speaks to the brokenness in humanity, period. It's called Oh Come to the Altar. It's by Elevation Worship, and I just fell in love with it. It says, are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of the sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. And the Course says, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today. There's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.